Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, if you are getting CE's credits, please make sure to sign up at the front and collect a survey form. All right. Thank you. Testing, testing.
Okay, everybody, we're going to get started because Dr. Keen has a lot of material to cover. It's going to be a great talk. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Scott Hyman. I work in the doctoral program. And is this on? Can you all hear me? Okay, now you can hear me. Okay. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our guest speaker today. I'd like to introduce Dr. Terence Keen who is director of the National Center for PTSD, the Behavioral Sciences Division, and associate chief of staff for research and development at the VA Boston Healthcare System. He is professor of psychiatry and assistant dean for research at Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Keen has published more than 300 articles, books, and chapters on the assessment and treatment of PTSD. If you read anything on PTSD, especially with veterans, he's in there. Um, for the past 35 years, his program of trauma research has been supported by federal funding agencies such as the VA, the National Institutes of Health, the DOD, and SAMHSA. Most recently, he was named co-principal investigator of the Consortium to Alleviate PTSD, an initiative supported by the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defense to improve the care of active duty military veterans with PTSD. His contributions to the field have been recognized by many national and international honors including the 2013 Distinguished Research Contributions to Clinical Psychology Award from APA's Society of Clinical Psychology, and a similar award from the Canadian Psychological Association in 2015. In 2011, Dr. Keene received an honorary Doctor of Science degree from Binghamton University. Go Bearcats! And in 2013, he received an honorary doctorate from the William James College for his major contributions to opening the field of psychological trauma to scientific inquiry. In 2015, he was named the recipient of the John Blair Barnell Award from the Department of Veterans Affairs, the highest national award for those engaged in clinical research. He has served as president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, the Association of VA Psychologists, APA's Division of Trauma Psychology, the Society of Clinical Psychology, and the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Just to give you an idea of uh, his accomplishments, this is Dr. Keene's res uh, resume. So one day, one day we can aspire to be as prolific and as uh, at making as many contributions as Dr. Keene. Um, we're very happy to have him here today. He was actually doing the tour of Miami, so he did a University of Miami School of Medicine yesterday, so we were lucky to also keep him here for an extra day and come to our university and um, have a little Albizu welcome gift bag for you. It includes a, uh, a, a t-shirt from the psychology, uh, the military psych club. So uh, here you go, you know, earbuds for the flight home. So we're, we're all set. And um, I really want to thank the uh, Institute, National Center for Scientific Research for uh, funding the event along with the doctoral program. I want to thank the Military Psych Club for being so accommodating to Dr. Keene's visit and um, uh, Sylvia in the doctoral program for organizing everything today. And so, not to hold us up any longer, let me hand over the mic to Dr. Keene. And let's give him a warm Albiza welcome. Thanks very much, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'll take this pile of paper and leave it over there. <coughs> um, it is my pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you. I, I, I believe that we're on for a couple of hours. I just want to make sure that um, people understand that uh, we have until 3 o'clock here today, if that makes sense to you. Those of you who have commitments elsewhere, please uh, feel free to wander in, wander out, whatever you do. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Scott uh, suggested in his introduction, I've been involved in the field of post-traumatic stress disorder for approaching 40 years now. Before it was actually a diagnosis of uh, PTSD in the di diagnostic manual, um, I had established a treatment program for Vietnam theater veterans who had what was then referred to as the Vietnam Stress Syndrome. Uh, those of you, uh, I don't think there's anybody who's been around uh, that long, but you will remember that <coughs> Vietnam veterans were suffering considerably from uh, the aftermath of, uh, of the war, the impact of the war. 
And uh, it was many, many years after the war concluded, 1973, 75, depending on how you count, that um, programs became available to help them. And it was somewhat controversial. In 1977, I was an intern in clinical psychology at the University of Mississippi Medical Center and <clears throat> um, had my first rotations in the VA in Jackson, Mississippi, where I saw many people with alcohol abuse problems who also reported significant difficulty in managing and coping with the experiences of the Vietnam War Zone. And it wasn't until a year later when I joined the faculty there that I began to see and piece together all of the different um, parameters associated with war trauma and um, uh, almost immediately uh, began a program for treating PTSD, what became known as PTSD, um, for the Vietnam Theater Veterans. What was remarkable to me at the time was um, how many people came. And it is not like we advertised on the internet in 1978, 79, <coughs> but rather it was all by word of mouth that there was a small group of people at the VA who got it. That was kind of the way in which it began. Um, there were no resources to establish this program. We wrote grants to um, try to provide the infrastructure necessary for the, uh, the treatment program. Um, and it wasn't really until maybe something around the order of seven or eight years afterwards that um, monies uh, began to appear for clinical care of what then became known as PTSD. So what are we going to do today? Well, <clears throat> I'm thinking that um, we have a number of different things that we can uh, touch on today. Um, <clears throat> this is the uh, sort of two-hour version. Yesterday at the University of Miami was uh, sort of like the one-hour version. Um, uh, but th uh, let me just say that um, um, I have so many slides th uh, because sometimes I'm asked to do six or seven hour versions of, um, of lecture given. So this is the two hour version and I think I've prepared enough information for you um, to try to consume. And what I wanted to try to tap on is sort of like the background of the whole issue of trauma and war trauma in particular. Then I want to talk a little bit about how to go about evaluating, assessing, diagnosing, measuring uh, PTSD. I'll ta uh, touch on that for a bit. And then I'm going to spend um, what I would think of as at least half of the session with you talking about the various treatments that exist that have evidence to support their use in uh, treating people uh, with this condition. Okay, so the goals of the workshop are to review prevalence of trauma exposure and PTSD, to review evidence-based assessment approaches for PTSD, and there are many, and there are many more than um, I actually will present today, um, to describe the evidence-based treatments for PTSD, and then to propose some of the future work as well. And I'll be talking about some of the things that um, my group is now currently working on both within the consortium for PTSD, but also separately um, supported by different agencies. Okay. So I do want to start by saying that um, um, unless you've been studying so hard that you haven't been listening to radio, TV, or reading newspapers, um, you've heard a little bit about the problems associated with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, let me be the, perhaps the first person to tell you that these are uniquely overblown by politicians for their own purposes. They are uniquely picked up by the media without counterbalanced arguments for reasons that we won't go into here today. But what I have assembled for you here today are just a few, and this is just a few, of the headlines about the quality of care provided to veterans in your Department of Veterans Affairs. And I do want to highlight um, a book written by <clears throat> a, um, a guy named Philip Longman, um, whose, the title of which was The Best Care Anywhere, Why Your Care Does Not Match VA care. 
And Philip Longman, just to give you the story, was hired by a journal out, um, uh, outfit to go in and basically dig up the muck about VA and the health care it was providing. It was more than 10 years ago now. And he went in thinking that this was going to be fun and this was going to be easy. And for more than one year, he traveled across the country to different VAs looking at the problems, the issues, the strengths, the limitations, and the weaknesses. The output of that effort on his part was a 180 degree change in the opinion that he had going in. And the title of his book, which was his title, was The Best Care Anywhere. And there were many reasons why he highlighted this, and it's not really important for me today to talk about it since we're talking about PTSD. I just like to show this slide when I'm out sort of in the country uh, because it's a counterbalance to what you might possibly be hearing on TV. And sure, our healthcare has problems, but so does every healthcare system in this country. And I was meeting with a small group of graduate students earlier, some in the military um, uh, uh, special interest group. Um, and I told them a little bit about my own personal experiences at one of the great Harvard hospitals when I, for the first time in my life, really needed healthcare. How the healthcare in one of the best institutions in the world failed consistently at every step of the way when I was diagnosed with a serious illness. So yeah, VA does have its problems, and each VA is different. VA Boston is different from VA Miami, which is different from VA Phoenix. But it is a healthcare system, and there are tremendous virtues and advantages to this healthcare system. So that's my sort of soapbox for a moment. Read and listen critically, carefully to what you hear. Um, because what VA is doing in many respects far exceeds the private sector. Okay, I'm just going to give you a quick case vignette. And I'm hoping that this case, for those of you who haven't worked with veterans or who, you, if you haven't worked um, in a VA or in a military setting, um, so that you'll sort of get a feel for what it is that uh, we work with, the material that we work with clinically. And so BD is a 29-year-old OIF. Um, I'll be using the terms OEF, Enduring Freedom, which is for Afghanistan, and OIF, which is Iraq, Operation Iraqi Freedom. So BD was a 29-year-old OIF, Iraq veteran um, of the Air Force. He was a rather unusual young man that he had an engineering degree, and his degree preceded his time in the military. He signed up for the military after he'd finished college in one of the sort of great universities in New York. Um, he was married at the time that he came in for care, and he had a, a relatively young, maybe a year or two old uh, baby. He had served a couple of tours in northern and central Iraq, which means he was away a lot, um, I think, in total, it was about 22 months that he uh, served overseas um, in a dangerous area, the time of heightened activity in Iraq. And he was assigned, uh, largely due to his um, education and training, he was assigned a very difficult set of duties, which was in the Explosive Ordnance Divisions. Um, anyone know what that means? Some do? Yeah, well, okay. so. Um, these are the folks who, um, upon learning that there's a mortar or a bomb or a rocket that hasn't exploded, um, they have the responsibility to make sure that the area is um, made safe. And this often involves um, going, inspecting, looking, examining, and then exploding the ordinance at safe, dis uh, safe distances. As you can imagine, um, mistakes can be made, as in hospitals. <laughs> Um, and it therefore constitutes a high-risk um, occupation. 
uh, it happens infrequently, but when it happens, everybody learns about it. And it's usually catastrophic and disastrous in many ways. So <clears throat> that was his job for uh, the better part of two tours. He came into VA Boston with a variety of symptoms, nightmares, nightmares about an explosion. Now, interestingly, most of the nightmares with people with post-traumatic stress disorder recapitulate the actual traumatic event. His nightmares were actually about something that didn't happen. It was an ordnance explosion, and he was either killed or injured. That, of course, constituted what the fear was, what the anxiety was for him when he was serving overseas. But it had never actually happened to him. He had heard about these things happening. So he was able to somehow or other incorporate this into his own personal experiences. And it came out about in, um, in nightmares, typically. He was preoccupied with his time there and some of the losses that he had sustained. Um, he experienced a lot of emotional numbing. There was some alcohol on board. There was significant amounts of marital conflict. And in fact, um, <clears throat> he came forward for care, um, largely due to his wife basically saying, you need to get help. He himself had not reached that point that he recognized it. But given that he had a, a relatively young marriage and a relatively young child, he felt that it was critical to conserve his marriage, his family, that he come forward for help. Now, <clears throat> keep in mind, of course, that this is a very unusual man. He had an engineering degree. He was very bright. He was an excellent student. He came from a family that had resources. He was married. The marriage was mostly still intact. The wife was very supportive of him. So this was, in many cases, uh, in many instances, this was a very good clinical case. In fact, the person seeing this individual, and for some instances, couple, was a trainee who was coming to me for supervision. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we wound up um, establishing a number of treatment goals that, um, uh, that we initially articulated and which BD agreed. And these goals were basically nightmare. He felt that everything that he was suffering from could be cured if he could only sleep. That was his take. There's a lot of logic to that. We all know what it's like to get a bad night's sleep. There are probably some people with young children in the room. Uh, you know what it's like if you sleep uh, only a couple of hours in a night. You don't do so well the next day. Well, imagine if this just goes on and on and on and on. It's a very complicated matter for people. And so that was how he saw, if you can just, you know, well then, but why aren't you sleeping? Well, I'm not sleeping because I'm having these nightmares. What are the nightmares of about ordnance explosions and on and on. And so it was really at the heart of his problem was the fear of, um, of death and dismemberment, injury and the like. And so we, came up with the notion of trying to figure out what to do for his nightmares, how to improve his sleep. Um, he had never really spoken with his wife about his two tours in Iraq. And so we didn't think that this was a good idea. She was completely in the dark about what he did and why it might be so difficult and why his sleep was so bad. She knew sleep was bad, but she didn't really understand what the big deal was, because he hadn't really shared much about it, which is often characteristic of many um, war veterans. They don't talk. In fact, some war veterans will die without talking about the experiences. Perhaps some of you have parents or grandparents who, um, for whom that it was the case. Um, I certainly did. And then um, the other thing that we wanted to do was to try to see if we could um, also consider the issue of this emotional numbing. I don't feel anything, Doc. I don't feel anything for my wife. I don't feel anything for my child. And so this became another target of care for this individual, was 
how to go about helping people using sort of behavioral strategies, cognitive strategies, to help him revive a much broader span of emotions. Now, people will often say with PTSD, I don't feel anything. And that's really not an accurate appraisal. They feel all things bad, all things negative. That's the difference. They feel nothing positive. They don't feel warmly towards someone. They don't feel love. In some instances, they don't feel sexual attraction to others. They don't feel the positive features of human existence. And that is a terrifically sad state for people. Now, you've seen this in other uh, kinds of psychopathology, if you will. You've seen it in major depression. You've seen it in, um, you've seen it in people with schizophrenia. You've seen it. But people with PTSD have this, I think, um, in ways that are not like those other. And I believe that with a lot of the work that's being done in emotional science today, and a lot of the work that's being done on creating emotional exercises that people can engage in, I think we can help people in the process of re-establishing things that they once had. I'm a little bit less sanguine or hopeful about establishing emotions for people, perhaps, who have never had those kinds of emotions in the past. And that's a whole different topic for a uh, trans transsectional approach to these kinds of emotional exercises. So this is the case of BD. I can just um, summarize for you that he did remarkably well in therapy. There was some exposure therapy, working a bit on the nightmares that he had. We also worked on some of the most difficult situations that he had where he lost friends. We um, engaged in some of these emotional exercises. We did the self-control strategies about sleep. We taught him uh, deep muscle relaxation as well as diaphragmatic breathing, which was seen as a, um, a tool to help him if he awoke in sweats in the middle of a, uh, of a nightmare. Now, he did not have night terrors, distinguishing nightmares from night terrors. Night terrors don't have content. People just wake up, they bolt up out of their bed, they're often drenched, soaking wet, and they don't really even know. You do see this in some forms of psychopathology. We don't see it so much in PTSD. We see nightmares in PTSD, where it is the experiences, the traumatic events themselves that are recapitulated. Um, in, in nightmares or in flashbacks as well. So this gentleman actually did very well in therapy. And he um, had about 17 sessions with um, the PTSD clinical fellow. And um, he began to once again appreciate his life. Now, what was interesting about this gentleman is that he was in um, he was in the um, active duty and then went into reserves. And it was during the period that he was in reserves that he came forward to help. And he made the decision, a very active decision, that he was not going to stay in the reserves, although that had been sort of like his lifelong plan. Um, he asked for um, the opinion of the therapist. The therapist came back and asked me, and my personal reaction was, although it might be a disappointment for him, it may actually save him a lot of heartaches and headaches if he does not go back into this war zone, because he had suffered a considerable amount. So this is, I think, um, an important kind of case for you all to see. This is the material that we try to manage in our PTSD clinics all across the country. And there's a PTSD clinic in every outpost, more than 1,000, I think it's 1,200 um, sort of outposts of VA all over the country. And these are the kinds of people who come forward. This is a positive outcome case, clearly. What I wanted you to have as a backdrop as we head into uh, the rest of the information is, what does a clinical case look like if you haven't been at VA? Yeah. Uh, 
It, oh, 17. It was, it was mostly weekly. Mostly <laughs> weekly. Yeah, so maybe four or five months would have been about right. Yeah. Okay. All right, so without um, much ado, I will say that um, the core features of the DSM-5, which are slightly different from DSM-4, are the following, the intrusive thoughts, the nightmares that we're referring to, um, the flashbacks, the preoccupation with the time of the trauma exposure, preoccup can't get it out of your mind, you think about it almost all the time, avoidant thoughts, trying to push things out of your mind constantly, whether it's a sexual assault, whether it's a, um, an incidence of domestic violence or community violence or an industrial accident or an automobile accident, what people are so concerned about is that these images, these thoughts that come back and replay in their mind will just enable them to do virtually nothing else. And so they engage in this very active avoidance. Negative alterations in mood and cognitions. These negative alterations are um, all about, I'm a bad person, I did a bad thing, I failed under pressure, um, it was what I wore, I should never have gone there, I should never have done that, I shouldn't have trusted them. All of these should-haves, could-haves that actually constitute um, important, I think, cognitive distortions about how people really lead their lives. And then indices of arousal, reactivity, startle reactions, um, sort of elevated uh, things like blood pressure, um, um, heart rate, galvanic skin re uh, response, all of these things, even at baseline, people with PTSD actually experience higher levels than people without PTSD. Um, if you present them trauma cues, <clears throat> then they actually um, sort of like pop right up very quickly, and they will remain up for a very long time. Uh, for some people, if they're exposed to something that, like a TV show where they show some footage about um, Iran or Iraq or, Iraq or um, Afghanistan or Somalia or Sudan, um, they can have trouble sleeping that night hours later because they can't kind of get it out of their minds. Okay. But. <laughs> All, right. All right, so the key conditions among combatants, anxiety, depression, no question. Um, with depression, grief, loss, we were talking a little bit earlier about moral injury. Um, family violence, anger and hostility. There's a lot of domestic violence in the lives of people with PTSD, whether the um, person with PTSD is male or female. Um, honestly, there's a lot of um, major difficulty in the interpersonal relationships, which um, will periodically spike with um, physical violence, or verbal violence. Memory concentration and attention problems, sleep difficulties, and um, in, in so many psychiatric conditions, the sleep problems are restricted to perhaps one, difficulty falling asleep or in the case of major depression, uh, um, hypersomnolence, uh, sleeping all the time, can't get out of bed kind of thing. In PTSD, um, sadly, um, people have the full range of sleep disorders, the dims and the does of sleep disturbance, the, um, difficulty uh, getting to sleep, difficulty falling to sleep, <clears throat> difficulty remaining asleep, early morning awakenings, and then periodically the um, sleeping all day and not getting out of bed. <clears throat> <clears throat> Interpersonal difficulties, uh, this goes across the board. There is a level of comfort many times in being in a group of people who've had the same experience. And we were earlier talking about some of the virtues of group therapy for PTSD. And that is, uh, I, I think of as the key virtue is that you're with people who have been through something similar. Now, it doesn't always make the group go easily, <laughs> let me just assure you of that. Um, but there is, I think, I think there is something about um, the comfort level that people who are combat veterans, who are with other combat veterans, or who are rape survivors, who you know, are in a small group of people who have experienced something similar, people who have um, experienced childhood sexual abuse or the like. 
these, there is a certain sense of strength coming from uh, multiple people. Suicidal ideation, um, you may know that of all the anxiety-related disorders, um, PTSD has the highest rate of suicidality, the highest numbers of suicides associated with it, and it falls behind just major depression and schizophrenia for um, uh, instances of suicide. So there is always a suicide risk, and this should be something that uh, comprises a portion of your evaluation. Uh, and if you get an endorsement of suicidal thoughts or behavior, um, making sure that you continue to assess for that throughout, um, however briefly, just to keep your finger on that particular pulse. Okay, so just a quick overview of psychological trauma. Let's just say <clears throat> um, uh, psychologists were very late to the uh, game of working with psychological trauma. Um, Physicians were very late to the game. Really, this area of um, sort of problem behavior, if you will, was in the hands of uh, the religious, the clergy, the, um, <clears throat> the artists, the poets, the playwrights. Um, and it was really v very late in the game, really in the mid-19th century um, before um, health professionals, if you will, started to become involved. Now, you might also say, well, that's really kind of when nursing and physicians sort of proliferated, and that's certainly true. Um, but prior to that, uh, there wasn't much care being provided apart from the professionals that I've talked with you about. And they approached it from the perspectives that they brought to the table uh, to employ. And so I'll just like, give you some sort of thoughts here. You know, the, um, the earliest sort of depictions of psychological trauma actually go back to the oldest literature in Western civilization. And you see on the left, Homer's Iliad. Uh, the Odyssey similarly reflected um, efforts on the part of the uh, people who fought in the Trojan War to recover, going from island to island in the Mediterranean Sea, trying to find their way home, but you know, really it was all metaphoric for trying to find the way to get to home so that they could be at home, that they could recover from the effects of the war on them, and that they could live in a civilized place and not behave in warlike ways. And Achilles in Vietnam, we were actually talking about this earlier, it was by Jonathan Shea and uh, someone that uh, Scott knew when he was in Boston, and I certainly have known Jonathan for um, many, many years, who actually developed the metaphor of, for on, on the topic of Vietnam combat veterans, basically bringing an understanding of what it was that Homer was talking about into the contemporary era. And it's very clear if you either read, just read Jonathan's book, Achilles in Vietnam, or <clears throat> go back and read The Iliad and the Odyssey if you feel like that would be something interesting. Um, you'll, you'll find that um, it's very much about the impact of trauma, the impact of war, and how war can pull people apart and push them together in ways that other life experiences cannot. And so this is really the oldest literature in Western civilization is about war trauma and PTSD. And there are some great depictions of PTSD in Homer's original book. But as I said, artists and you know, poets and playwrights all captured psychological trauma in ways that are pretty amazing in my mind. This is a piece of ancient Greek pottery that was in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And about five years ago, it was returned to Italy where it had been taken after World War II. But on this um, uh, piece of art, which is more than 2,000 years old, is depicting a battle scene. And you can think in your mind that, well, it's, it's interesting that they paint it, but why would they paint battle scenes <coughs> except, of course, to honor the people who had fought in battles to protect the towns, the villages, the regions where they lived. 
And so this was a way in which the heroism of war could be displayed for entire communities in important ways. And these were artists and artisans who did this. You know, over time, similar kinds of things occurred. The Romans, um, anyone who's been to any of the key museums in the world will um, see some of the amazing sculptures from the Roman era 2,000 years ago. And so many of them are about military heroes. Government heroes too, but government heroes were often military heroes before they were government uh, heroes. And you'll see <clears throat> all kinds of statues honoring them again, probably for the same purposes. Now, does anyone know who the lady with the lamp is? Yeah, good for you. Good for you. You have a nursing background? It's only the nurses that I talk to who get this question. He's a well-read gentleman. Yes, yeah, so the lady with the lamp. Again, this um, you know, important depiction here <coughs> of Florence Nightingale. <coughs> Florence Nightingale was basically one of the originators of the nursing profession. <coughs> and, <coughs> and what you <coughs> probably don't know about Florence Nightingale, Nightingale is that she came from a very wealthy, well-educated British family, um, <coughs> mid-19th century. And um, d do you know the war that she kind of was involved in? Sort of interesting. No, okay, it's the Crimean War. <coughs> um, uh, I guess things all come in full circle because, you know, perhaps we'll be, <laughs> be in another war again soon in Crimea. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, Crimea being the, re the, the region recently taken from Ukraine by um, uh, the Russian potentate. But the interesting part of this story of, um, of Florence Nightingale is that she would go as a nurse with few tools in, at this time to help alleviate the suffering of people. She would go to the tents at night with a lamp. And she would spend time with people and, you know, comfort them and hold them and sort of try to help them, knowing that many of these people would die, not necessarily from the wounds, but of course from infections, which were virulent in these kinds of camps and these hospitals. And these hospitals that she was in were very close to the front line, so there was danger as well. Uh, so she was seen as sort of an angel, angel of the night, lady with the lamp. And what few people know about this uh, sort of icon of Western civilization is that uh, uh, she lived a very, very lonely life after she returned. Her single goal and emphasis was to help the profession of nursing to proliferate throughout the world. And she actually had a major um, relationship with Boston University's hospital in the city of Boston. We actually have a bust of her um, in the waiting area in the School of Medicine uh, because she was so instrumental in establishing nursing care in the city of Boston at what became Boston City Hospital and what became Boston University Medical Center over time. <clears throat> but what was really sort of sad, if you get a chance to read a biography her, of her life, and there are many out there, is that it is as likely as I'm standing here that she suffered terribly from post-traumatic stress disorder. She had inclination towards drink, <clears throat> and uh, she lived a very, very alone existence for much of the end of her life. And <clears throat> it is likely that she herself, in efforts to try to mitigate the effects of war and mitigate the effects of uh, physical injuries, actually developed this condition um, herself, uh, somewhat sadly, but remained mostly functional in terms of her professional work. You know, <clears throat> um, perhaps the most common, is this, this isn't that clear here, but this, this is a you know, wonderful depiction of psychological trauma. Edvard Munch's from Oslo, Norway, his scream, uh, one of which is, was stolen from the um, Munch Museum in Oslo. But what you see here is um, sort of a, um, a, an, an a face, facial expression, 
that is very hard to interpret. And you know, you look at this painting, and many things could happen. But what you see in the background are um, ships in the harbor, and you can only imagine that someone has been lost at sea, whether it's at war, or just the demands of being a sailor um, in the um, 19th century. <clears throat> a remarkable depiction of trauma in my mind. <clears throat> Picasso's greatest work of art, Guernica, um, depicting the decimation of bodies and animals and the like after the uh, Spanish Civil War in the town of Guernica. So <clears throat> today what you actually can point to is um, a considerable amount of literature that's touched on the topic of psychological trauma. And I live in a little town. I uh, um, have a summer house in a little town on Cape Cod uh, where Sebastian Younger um, also resides in the summertime. And <clears throat> um, a few years back, I saw something hanging on the grocery store um, saying that Sebastian Younger was going to be talking about his most recent work about being embedded in the war zone in Afghanistan. And <clears throat> that work led to an Academy Award nominated film called Restrepo. And then a book followed about one year later called War by Sebastian Younger. And what is amazing, there are, there are a million books out there about war, people depicting war, and people depicting trauma of all sorts. And what's remarkable and interesting to me about this particular book is that it's written by a journalist, someone who has been a writer his whole career, who intentionally embedded himself for much of 15 months, much, not all of the 15 months, <coughs> it with Bravo co Company in the Corangal Valley, a hot, hot conflict area in the first few years of um, the war in Afghanistan. What is amazing <clears throat> is that he can put into words things that are so finely nuanced that most people who are trying to put their experiences down on paper can't really do. And that's what separates this book out from many of the others. <clears throat> when I finally read this book, I was actually reading it <clears throat> when, it uh, when it came out at my Cape House, which didn't have internet, if you can imagine. <clears throat> um, and so I'm reading the book and I came across these passages and this struck me. The unit, now this was 15 months, <clears throat> the 15 months of uh, deployment, was in over 400 firefights during the time and they came home deeply traumatized by their experiences. This was his take. The most upsetting thing for them was their loss, the loss of their friends. They felt responsible for their deaths, convinced there was something they could have done to prevent their friends' deaths, and a sense of guilt that they should have been killed instead. Now, this captures many things for me. Now, among the things that I've done in my career is to try to sort of create measures of exposure to trauma. And so one of the measures that we developed was a combat exposure measure some years ago, and some many years ago. And um, we, it was like, a, you know, a zero to four point scale kind of thing, you know, Likert type measure. And zero was no combat experiences or no firefights. And um, in this case, the outer four was 50 firefights, because that was what we thought was like the upper end of what people from Vietnam were experiencing. And what the group being sent to fight in Afghanistan and to some extent in Iraq, they're experiencing is just an incredible level of combat exposure. 400 firefights is what he reported Bravo Company had experienced during that time period. That is a huge amount of combat. And while most people probably just like pass through that, say, okay, 400, blah, boom. What's important for, I think, this group to understand is that these people are going over. They're going over for multiple tours as BD went for two. We have people in Boston who are on their seventh tour of duty 
over these 15 years. I'm sure the same is true in Florida and in Texas and California and all over this country. And they're seeing this level of combat exposure. This is important and it distinguishes this war, which is long, we all know it's long, but the ramifications of it being long are that people are seeing many tours of duty and they're seeing a huge amount of combat during these times. Granted, the last few years have been far less um, hostile, uh, but you still hear these punctuation marks periodically. Okay. All right, so some of the things that um, sort of affected me in my career were the observational studies. And these are, this didn't come out very well, because these are books that have been on my shelf for now 40 years. Uh, this is a 50 year, this is a, a first edition of Henry Crystal's uh, book on massive psychic trauma. Um, the chairman of psychiatry at Yale is now John Crystal, and uh, John's father, Henry, just passed away about one year ago in his 90s. But Henry Crystal was himself from Europe, and he interviewed as part of an, a, a project funded by private philanthropy, he interviewed hundreds of people who had survived the concentration camps in Europe and had been refugees coming to either Europe or US. <clears throat> and here he depicted, this is, book was published in 1968, he depicted what would become eventually very similar to the diagnostic criteria in the DSM-3 in 1980. And this was 12, published 12 years before. So Henry Crystal, key. Um, my friend and colleague, Robert J. Lifton, who's now um, in his early 90s, one of the icons of 20th century American culture, among the things that he wrote about was the Vietnam War. And this book was published in 1971, I believe, Home from the War, Vietnam Veterans, Neither Victims Nor Executioners. And Robert J. Lifton has written about the Nazi doctors, he's written about um, the, uh, the Holocaust, he's written, <clears throat> he's written about um, uh, Chinese uh, brainwashing, he's written about Hiroshima, and it was um, um, Rob, Robert Lifton who uh, sort of coined the term the imprint of death, which was in interviewing people from Hiroshima, he, who had survived Hiroshima, some 20 years later, interviewing them 20 years later, for those people who were most seriously disturbed, and again, there were no terms about this, they appeared to have death on their faces. And he referred to this as the imprint of death. And for combat veterans, you can frequently see what Robert was referring to. Robert lives in Boston, he used to live in New York, he has a house on the Cape very close to mine. He swims in my pond. He and his late wife, Betty Jean, <clears throat> were among the most interesting people I have ever met in my life. These were um, premier intellectuals of 20th century America. And Robert re recently published, it must be four years ago, recently published his memoirs about working on all of these various projects. He himself is a psychiatrist, but he actually worked in psychology departments <clears throat> in New York City, like at CUNY. He was in psychiatry and psychology at Yale, and more recently he's been at Harvard, just sort of doing his own thing. An amazing man. So current events highlight PTSD's relevance for sure. Anybody here who was alive in 2001 remembers the Twin Towers coming down, amazing. For those of us who um, came from New York, for anyone who was in Windows in the World, Windows in the World, um, <clears throat> you can't even imagine what the impact of this was like for people who lived in New York, let alone any other parts of the country. And it was, I point to this uh, time, the events of 9-11, as a time when <clears throat> um, my uh, recently deceased mother um, actually got the acronym correct <laughs> of my life's work, PTSD, um, because it was in the newspaper all the time. She'd always say, she, before that, she would say, you know, that PTS thing, Terry, you're doing it. But it was on the lips. It was a very big marker, point, <clears throat> of 9-11. Everybody knew what PTSD was. 
when I said I was national uh, director of the National Center for PTSD, people would like say, what? Afterwards, nobody ever said what. They, under they got it. And so there was, you know, in the 20 years time since the diagnosis was created, those first 20 years, people didn't really know much about it. It wasn't in the common parlance or the American psyche at all. It's really only been the last 15 years that pretty much everybody knows. So it's, <clears throat> you know, you can talk about whether PTSD is a valid diagnosis, but it's ecologically valid. People know what PTSD is now, whether it's the wars or 9-11, whatever. Other kinds of events, certainly military combat as we've been discussing, and then, you know, the, uh, the events of Hurricane Katrina. <clears throat> Now you see the flooding here of the Crescent City, you see the sea of New Orleans. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we know is that, um, <clears throat> pardon me, one of the things that we know is that uh, events that are traumatic, that are usually of human design, sort of like natural disasters, don't have the same sort of emotional effect on people. It can, but it doesn't at the same frequency or, or, or level. What most people don't appreciate about Hurricane Katrina, however, is that Hurricane Katrina wasn't really a natural disaster. Sure, it was a five category hurricane, and we're all afraid of that who live anywhere near the water. But what caused this level of disaster was a known vulnerability. It was that the dikes <coughs> were not prepared, and it was known for years and years and years before this Cat 5 hit. And you can really think why this, as a technological disaster, has caused so much trouble for the people who live in New Orleans. This is a major, major problem for people. It's documented in epidemiological studies, mostly done by Ron Kessler from Harvard, but across, really, the whole country. It's just an amazing technological disaster that is presumed to be a function of um, um, a hurricane, and it wasn't. It was, the disaster was um, of human design, human failure. Okay, so prevalence, cost, and burden of PTSD. I'll just very quickly go over this. Um, PTSD is a global problem. <clears throat> it occurs in all segments of American society, for sure. Um, socioeconomic levels do not protect you from developing PTSD by no means. Um, and it cuts across all languages and cultures, and it has been present in every part of the world where people have attempted to measure it. I can say that today, and I could say that 10 or 15 years ago, prior to that, PTSD was seen as a uniquely Western developed world problem. And the many studies that I'm going to present here very briefly to you <coughs> suggest that it is not. And what's important about this slide, <coughs> not only is PTSD found in all parts of the world, where you might expect PTSD to be high because there's been internecine warfare and devastation, the prevalence rates of PTSD reflect that. So places like Algeria, Cambodia, Ethiopia, known places with high trauma, have high rates of PTSD. This goes across these three countries, go across continents, they go across cultures, <laughs> languages, et cetera, races, et cetera. And so what we see here is, I think, a validation of the fact that PTSD is a worldwide global problem of central importance. If a country like Algeria or Cambodia or Ethiopia has this many people with PTSD, and if a significant proportion of those people with PTSD are disabled, this becomes an economic problem for that country. In the early 1990s, the World Health Organization, combined with the World Bank, conducted a series of studies published by a couple of guys from Harvard, Murray and Lopes, basically saying that mental health problems were key to the recovery 
of countries from disasters of all types and that more focus needed to be placed on helping people to recover from mental health problems. In particular, they were talking about PTSD, but not exclusively. Now, why, you might say, was the World Bank ever interested in supporting a study that was going to look at these kinds of things? And the answer is, the World Bank is the international agency that delivers funds to countries that have been devastated by war, natural disaster, etc. And they could not understand why countries following an earthquake with massive devastation could recover economically within a period of years. But countries devastated by civil war, where there was considerable strife, no matter how much money they put into the economy, did not seem to recover. And the answer that these guys sort of arrived at is, there's a complete lack of infrastructure in so many of these countries to provide mental health services. And that, to me, comes to the importance of PTSD at every conceivable level, at the individual level of analysis, at the family level of analysis, at the community level of analysis, but also at the national and international level of analysis. The nations are struggling economically, and the international community is expending its resources to try to help these countries, and they may be misplacing their money. That money placed in the healthcare system, and in particular, the mental healthcare system, may ultimately be important at some point to promote the appropriate level of recovery. Okay. Um, I think many of you likely know that exposure is higher in men. <clears throat> um, most people think that um, women are more likely to be exposed to traumatic events. It's not the case. Many studies, nationally representative studies, suggest that men are more likely to be exposed to traumatic events. And it's a statistically significant difference, although it's not like women are getting off easy. <clears throat> Um, half of women will experience a traumatic event or more in their lives, 60% of men. And for men, it's a lot of, you know, community violence, fighting, combat, um, automobile wrecks, and things that are life-threatening of this sort. For women, however, the kinds of events to which they're exposed are different. It is interpersonal violence predominantly. It is sexual assault and rape. And we now know that for men and for women, rape actually constitutes one of the more difficult things from which people can recover. Okay, so women develop PTSD at twice the rate and the lifetime prevalence of PTSD at twice the rate in women versus men. 10% of women will have PTSD in their lives, 5% of men will have PTSD in their lives. Um, <clears throat> quality of life, vitality, social functioning, all down with PTSD. Much worse than major depression, much worse than uh, um, OCD, and certainly much worse than general population. This is SF36 uh, scores, John Ware's measure. Um, you know, I think, I don't know why I put this in, but if you look at Boston's Big Dig, or there were estimates this morning of $14 billion to build the wall in the, along the border of Mexico. <clears throat> but you think of um, these, these numbers came from 2011 and 2012, um, wh one from Brown University and one from the Kennedy School at Harvard. Uh, $4 trillion these wars are going to cost, four to $6 trillion is what L Linda Bilms at the Kennedy G School suggested, and, and the wars are still going on five or six years later. So um, these numbers are you know, woefully out of date. Remarkable. Okay, so what do these wars look like for people? Well, um, among the things that are important to know is that half of the people serving are from the reserves of the Guard. Um, 12, maybe as many as 14% are women. Multiple tours of duty, as I've discussed. The families of a professional military, you know, in Vietnam, the average age was 18 point, uh, 19.1. Uh, the average age here actually is um, in, in the late 20s into the early 30s, so these people have uh, wives, husbands, and children. Uh, 2.8 million, 2 million Americans have served in the global war on terrorism, 7,000 more de deaths, 65,000 serious injuries. So this is what we are facing as a country. The signature wounds are pain, chronic pain, TBI, and PTSD. 
And I'll just uh, point out here, the important thing is that uh, we rarely see one of these conditions. We actually see um, many of them. Uh, here we go. Um, and so you see the intersection of the Venn diagram here. Um, <clears throat> in a, a consecutive cohort from our clinic of 340 cases, 42% actually had all three um, chronic pain, um, PTSD, and TBI. And we didn't measure um, very effectively or very well substance abuse, but had we, substance abuse would have been um, right up there too. Okay, our conceptual model for PTSD, just to give you a handle on this, is um, basically uh, generalized psychological vulnerability by generalized biological vulnerabilities. These could be certainly genetics. This could be, you know, people are all different really at the outset. From, the, from the, your arrival, you're different. Um, then you experience a trauma here, um, which leads to this very powerful true alarm. And this true alarm is just overwhelming emotion, physiology, overwhelming, powerful kinds of experiences, which then actually um, leads to learned alarm. Now this could be, you know, if you want to do Pavlovian, this could be um, classical condition, you know, the learned alarm. So that cues that, reminiscent, re that are reminiscent of the experience begin to trigger this alarm here. This leads to anxious apprehension. Will this occur again? Um, I have to be on my alert. I have to be on my guard. Um, and it leads to people to avoid things that resemble the place of the trauma. Now, the good news is that there is a very strong effect um, of social support and ability to cope. And I think this accounts for why so many people re do recover. So the, the whole idea is that um, maybe upon exposure, something in the neighborhood of 20 or 25% of people go on to develop PTSD. So 75% of people don't. And you have to ask yourself the question, why do some people get better and others do not? And the, the answer is in this set of equations here. It's what you were born with psychologically, what you were born with biologically, your genes, um, the strength of the conditioning, and then these kinds of different reactions, whether you avoid or not, and whether or not you um, have considerable amount of social support um, coming at you afterwards. And this, of course, has, I, I think, great implications for what we need to be doing to help people in the post-exposure environment. We need to be helping them utilize their existing coping strategies. We need to um, help people to acquire other ways of coping to avoid negative coping strategies like drinking or drugging or um, hiding out or um, isolating yourself. And we need the social support systems in the family and in the community uh, to come to bear on helping people in this recovery process. Okay. So assessing and diagnosing. Just to be clear, when we first began this work, there were no measures. Um, nothing existed, and um, part of the work that our group has done over the years is to try to make sure that we have measures that are really workable by clinicians in the field. And I think just for those of you who are involved in this kind of business, these are the um, sort of strategy. whoops, here we go, uh oh yeah, we go. Uh, these are the sort of strategies that one takes in developing PTSD. Now, um, I'll just go to that third line there, presuming PTSD to be a dimensional construct. Now, um, this is something that um, um, I sort of kind of came to very, very early in the work that this was on a continuum. But it, there was a very big pushback um, in the early years, probably for a full decade, about whether or not this was a continuous variable versus there were just some people who fell off a cliff, and that's the people who had PTSD. <clears throat> there have been a whole host of taxometric analyses um, to try to, uh, to understand whether or not something like PTSD is dimensional or whether it is categorical, categorical yes or no. And the answer to the question, without uh, sort of getting too much into it, is that it is clearly dimensional, di di and it's irrespective of the kind of trauma. So let me just give you, PTSD was first introduced in DSM-3. 
Uh, DSM-3 to DSM-3R, um, very small changes, but there were increased symptoms. There was re-experience, avoidance of numbering, and hyperarousal. Um, and then from DSM-3R to DSM-4, criterion A was extensively reworked. And this, I, I, I was on the committees for 3R and 4, and I was a consultant to 5. I didn't have a lot to do with 5. But the DSM-3R to DSM-4 actually was a very critical period in, in the field. Uh, the, the criterion A, if you remember, before it was in place for like 10 or 12 years, it was a bifurcated thing. You had to have exposure, and then you had to have a person's response. Remember, you had to like feel um, fear, horror, terror, helplessness. Do you remember this? Sort of, uh, it was criterion A1 versus criterion A2. That was completely removed in DSM-5, um, in part because of work that our group had done, which I was skeptical right from the outset that this was going to be a useful thing, and it was not useful at all. And then I'll just you know, go, if I can, to the assessment devices. So uh, part, of the, um, part of the problem of being in the assessment device uh, business is that um, PTSD um, changes. So it's gone from 3 to 3R to 4 to uh, 4TR to 5. And so this has been basically um, a, a part of my life's work has been to oversee the development of lots of these measures over time and to validate them against the diagnostic criteria. Um, so 1980 was the diagnosis. The mid-1980s was something called the National Vietnam Veterans Readjustment Study. And this was the first time that any country had ever evaluated the psychological impact of war. And the news wasn't good. And 15% uh, of the people um, in the late 1980s still had PTSD 15 years after the war. There was this notion that people would recover quickly. And in fact, that just didn't happen. People, a large segment of people did not recover. Um, there were many scales that our group and others developed, the Mississippi scale, uh, the impact of event scale, the PK scale, which is the PTSD scale, um, sort of with my last name on it, uh, the structured clinical interview for the DSM, and the DIS PTSD modules. These were all things that were developed to try to measure PTSD for certain ways. Okay. In the last 20 years, there have been rapid growth in the number of new measures. Um, and this is just continuing as the DSM-5 um, goes on. Um, <clears throat> and there's now something that's, uh, that's not yet in the diagnostic manual, but which is becoming very fashionable, which is called complex PTSD. And complex PTSD is a diffuse level of response to what I think of as childhood physical and sexual abuse and neglect all kind of combined, and then what do people look like as adults? And it's a very complicated diagnosis, but there are a lot of very smart people now working on this. Okay. I'll just say this is um, the evidence about uh, taxonometric analyses that um, came from our group and others as well. So it is a dimensional thing. Some people have more than others, et cetera. Um, this is um, the first measure of PTSD that was validated, the Mississippi Scale for Combat-Related PTSD. This was from our group. And this was actually the basis in the uh, first national epidemiological study of PTSD. This measure was the measure that um, worked out to be the best, the strongest measure of PTSD. But more recently, in the, uh, the late 80s into the early 90s, uh, came the CAPS, the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale. If you um, Google Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, you can access that easily from your computer, your, uh, from your uh, desktop. All right, so I think the diagnostic interviews, psychological testing, and the neurobiological testing um, all combined. So uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about the importance of, you know, understanding that every measure of anything has a degree of fallibility associated with it, and that what's really important is that you have multiple measures that you can look at, ways in which you can go about um, trying to understand the presence, the absence, and the extent of any psychological condition. And the, the thing to keep in mind is something that um, 
um, I wrote about in, um, a, in a text with Dave Barlow was that all of these things that we use, the diagnostic interviews, the psychological testing, neurobiological testing, whether it's imaging or blood work or psychophysiology, all of these things contain error. There is no single gold standard in any of these things. And so all of them being imperfect, they require efforts on the clinician's part to use their judgment and to arrive at a decision. And that decision is based on your clinical judgment, on your feel, but looking at data from as many different vectors of information as you can possibly. This could include things like medical records, past history, family reports, psychological testing, neurobiological testing, and then having it all there, either just on your desk as you're trying to make your decisions, or at a case conference where you present all of the things that you've learned and then you try to elucidate from the group a consensus about what is it that's happening here. Now you may say, well, why go to such trouble? Well, in our healthcare system, a diagnosis of PTSD is a very expensive thing. It is expensive in the healthcare that people will eventually receive, it may be expensive in terms of the benefits that somebody receives, and these benefits may go for years, or they could be lifelong, financial monthly payments. And so it is up to us as clinicians to make the right decision. In our healthcare system, the benefit of the doubt always goes to the patient, to the veteran, and as it should be. But having information from many different sources to help make that decision, and then to case conference something so that the decision is made by one person, one person's license, but with considerable input and thought coming from a smaller community of people. This is sort of, I think, the gold standard for diagnoses when there is so much on the line for people. Okay, so for diagnosing PTSD, there are structured diagnostic interviews. Um, I've already mentioned the CAPS. There's something called the PTSD Symptom Scale, uh, the Structured Interview for PTSD, the PTSD Interview, uh, the PTSD Module of the SCID. The SCID is probably the most commonly used scale in the whole country diagnostically. It's called the Structured Clinical Interview for the DSM. SCID is from Columbia University. So these are all very important measures. But there are other kinds of dimensional measures. So we use the PCL a lot, the PTSD checklist for measuring PTSD. Well, <clears throat> the PCL doesn't give you a diagnosis necessarily. You just add up the scores. So it gives you a sense of how many symptoms people are reporting. And there are many others that do just the same thing. But I will say that when <clears throat> uh, push comes to shove, it's really not about the diagnosis. It's, it's really about what are you going to do to help the patient in their recovery process. And <clears throat> from my vantage point, this is where the functional analysis comes to play. And this is every bit as important as all the other pieces, although the other pieces, I don't want to minimize the diagnosis of things or the dimensionality of things, because these are important matters, especially, for example, I know that you have a, um, a forensic uh, core here or a component here. Uh, if you're in a courtroom, you need to know um, things like how much, not just if, but how much of if, and you get that using different kinds of approaches to assessment. So, but when you're doing functional analysis, you're talking about something else. What are the person's strengths? What are their assets? What are their advantages? Oh. Secondly, what are the patient's limitations? What can they not do? Why can't they do them? What do they think the most important things are? What are their complaints? And then to ask the question in conjunction with the patient and their family, <clears throat> what is it that you really want to change and why? Now, there's a whole other area, those of you who are studying substance abuse, um, 
know what Bill Miller <coughs> developed in the late 80s, something called motivational interviewing. Now, mo motivational interviewing has been used now in everything. I mean, <coughs> medication adherence, just, it's just an approach. It's just become a really accepted tool <coughs> for trying to help people figure out what do they really want to do? What is really their priority? And I think that's why motivational interviewing has become so popular worldwide is because it take, it's taking into account not what the, you know, sort of parental therapists <coughs> think ought to change, but it's trying to combine the therapist and their knowledge and experience with what the patient's personal motivations are like. What is the hierarchy of needs? <coughs> I'll <coughs> frequently say, pardon me, <clears throat> when you're dealing with somebody who's, deal <clears throat> who's trying to manage the after effects of domestic violence, the hierarchy of needs is not treating their PTSD. The hierarchy of needs is first safety, then shelter, then food for the individual, for their children, <clears throat> and then maybe weeks, months down the line, perhaps uh, therapy. Uh, would be warranted, but it's trying to make sure that you place the important things in the lives of people in some kind of hierarchy so that you can, <coughs> pardon me, I'm sorry, I struggle because I have asthma, let's just, <coughs> <coughs> so the hierarchy of needs and making sure you um, have them appropriately and agreed upon by the patient. What are the structural changes in the environment that are necessary? What are the interpersonal problems? And here you have the spouse, the wife, the husband, um, the employer, the neighbors, et cetera, all of which may be contributing to maintaining some of the difficulties in the lives of the individual. What are the emotional reactions needing change? We talked about, uh, it's not just you know, the anger and, and teaching anger management, but in the cases of people with PTSD, <clears throat> I'm okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I'm not okay. I'm struggling, <laughs> obviously. <clears throat> but, but I have plenty of water. That's not the problem. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, we talked earlier about BD, the case of BD, where he couldn't feel things. And so we engaged in these emotional, try to feel joy. What does joy look like? Can you see some examples on television of somebody who's feeling joy? Can you mimic that emotion? Can you feel happiness? Can you sit and imagine feeling happiness? Let's sit and imagine feeling, giving people the opportunity to feel and helping them to relearn some of these emotions. So it's the emotional reactions needing, needing change are not all the aversive things. It's also trying to inculcate some of the more positive things as well. <clears throat> So are there effective treatments for PTSD? Well, the answer today is absolutely yes, there are. But I'm gonna give you a, a quick tour of the history of this whole field in this area. Uh, well, I guess it's the history according to Terry Keane because there are many other histories out there. So I think the, um, <clears throat> the, the again, the, you know, 77, 78, 79, when you know, I was trying to figure out what this whole thing was, what was I seeing and how was I seeing it, there was very little information in the classical literature at all. There was just virtually nothing. Talking about these, zero. And so I went back to many of the classic textbooks. And one of the classic, in my comparative psychotherapies course in graduate school, <clears throat> was a guy named Otto Fenichel. And some of you who are more senior may actually know this text. It's a very famous uh, textbook that was used for dozens and dozens of years after he wrote it in 1945. Um, <clears throat> but he had a very, soft, very small, I think a few pages, on um, trauma. And he basically said the idea in trauma is to quiet the high levels of anxiety and reactivity to the event. And I thought this was a brilliant observation at the time. And then secondly, to reconstruct the details of the event with the emotional reactions in order to promote mastery. I thought this was absolutely on target. Now, <clears throat> truth be told, I had already been dabbling around using things like 
systematic desensitization, some of the earliest forms of exposure therapy, skills training therapy, anxiety management skills. <clears throat> but the thing that was really important was trying to help people reconstruct what happened in the combat experience. And this is exactly what Fenichel had written about in 1945. Now, he didn't have the advantage of having all of these specific tools that existed uh, stemming from the 50s and the 60s and to the early 70s, the advantage that I had, and so that I could apply existing tools to the problems. But I saw it very much as Fenichel did, that this was the task, to get people to sort of like have the ability to ratchet down the emotion at the same time as promoting mastery over these really catastrophic life experiences with people dying all around them, exploding around them, being physically injured themselves and the like. And that was the task. And I was deeply appreciative of Fenichel's work, <clears throat> although I probably read it in the early 80s. I was deeply appreciated because somebody who was way older than me, and I was in my 20s during this time, somebody way older than me, way respected than I, certainly more than I was, actually was on to the same sorts of concerns about how to help people in therapy. And there were other people <clears throat> as well. Um, <clears throat> one of the great books that, I, um, that I've read, which I can um, recommend to you, is Viktor Frankl's um, uh, Man's Search for Meeting about logotherapy, which is a very thin read. Uh, those of you who are in school, you could read it within a day. <clears throat> But here, this is a review of it in 1992 by um, Lance, who says, in Franklin Psychotherapy, the PTSD client is helped to remember the details of their trauma experiences to identify the meaning opportunities embedded in the memories of the trauma and to make use of such meaning for giving to the world. This is a, such a holistic view of what exposure therapy actually is and does. It is <clears throat> a much more beautiful way of characterizing what it is that happens in the context of exposure therapy. And <clears throat> you know, people like Edna Foa and her colleagues and my colleagues who have worked using exposure therapy with trauma all concede that so much of the therapy that happens is after you've reviewed the content of the traumatic experience and then you begin to pose questions. What did you think? What did you feel? What was different about this trial versus prior trials? Was there anything new that came into your mind? How are you feeling now about this experience? And that kind of sort of Socratic type questioning forms what I consider to be the important cognitive features of exposure treatment. It's not just the absolute exposure, in my view, nor in Edna's view. It is about this further processing, the emotional processing, some people refer to it as, that occurs with this kind of Socratic type questioning in the aftermath of the use of exposure. And here, I thought he just captured this brilliantly in um, this article here. Um, hypnotherapy, this is um, Pierre Janet, 19th century. <clears throat> and this was again important to me. Ono Vanderhart from Holland um, wrote a review of this, a historic review. And one of the things that struck me was the therapeutic advances from pathological grief and PTSD, those are my words, make it clear that the trauma per se must be accessed before mourning can proceed. This was 19th century. So I'm just going to step aside for a moment and say to you <clears throat> that in the 19, early 1980s, when I first started to publish on the use of exposure therapies with PTSD, there was huge, um, huge professional pushback from the entrenched intelligentsia in the mental health field. It was huge. And the reason that all of these articles citing prior important people in the field became very important to me to collect and to keep over time 
was because although I was using different words coming from scientific clinical psychology, that's sort of where I came from, what was important is that there's basically nothing new under the sun. That in the 19th century, Pierre Genet was talking about this. In <clears throat> World War II, um, Otto Fanichel was talking about exactly what I thought was important to do. That Viktor Frankl, in the aftermath of the camps, wrote about things that were precisely about accessing the traumatic experience. That the goal was to help people overcome the overwhelming emotion associated with the trauma. There was nothing new about what it was that I was doing. And I will just tell you that I was invited in 1982 to the University of Minnesota. My older brother was on the faculty in the School of Medicine at the time. And I said, hey, I'm coming to Minnesota, I'm getting taught. I thought I was like, you know, I was like, sort of like blithely walking to the slaughterhouse or something. And I, I didn't realize what I was in for at the University of Minnesota, who <laughs> wanted to attack me on the basis of the first few half dozen articles that we had published. They wanted to take me apart, the people at the University of Minnesota, in the psychology department. And it got so bad, the crowd was like larger than this crowd. <clears throat> and my brother was sitting here in the far right hand. And the attacks became very vociferous. And fortunately, I had been schooled on handling myself to, you know, sort of vicious attacks and the like, and was perfectly comfortable, but I paused and hesitated because somebody said something that I was going to be really be able to give him a very strong empirical answer to. So I was pausing, collecting my thoughts, and my brother thought that I was frozen because I was a kid, I was 10 years younger than he was, and he was ready to get up and take this guy out. <clears throat> And I, I remember saying to him, sit down, <laughs> the poor guy. And, and, um, and what happened subsequently in that environment was that the evidence that we had collected over the first few years in our program began to weigh heavily on what were some of the premier people in all of clinical psychology. And I wish, I only wish, they had had all of these slides that went back to their teachers and their professors who were saying very much the same thing. But because people didn't have the experience and they thought that I was either making things up or that I was creating something new that was to my advantage, I'm not sure what that would have been, and they were ready to just take me out. But the truth of the matter is that all of the things that we've been writing about for these past near 40 years are things that have appeared throughout time, throughout history in clinical psychology. There is nothing really new. It's systematically done, it's carefully done, it's better defined, it's, you know, we now know what, we have terms for these things uh, that these guys didn't have, but we now today do. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna skip the behavioral conceptualization, so I've given you the other. Uh, this is the first uh, study in an APA journal um, uh, on PTSD. And this was the exposure treatment, imaginal flooding and the treatment of PTSD. It wasn't called exposure therapy until uh, the late 80s. And I'll just say too, this is actually, uh, these are I thought interesting to show here. This, uh, this is not interesting because it shows uh, the successful treatment, although it does. This is more interesting in that this is a 19 day inpatient stay. And this is a case that we saw in 1979-80. And this gentleman, combat veteran with PTSD, was actually hospitalized, I think it was for a total of 24 days, 19 of which I treated him. You don't hospitalize people for PTSD today anymore. No, you just don't. It's just like, it, it was, it's so, it's, it, this, I, I actually thought that was the important point here, how much we have changed in our healthcare system in these 40 years, that uh, the notion of having somebody three weeks for a PTSD diagnosis in, inpatient is just, it's sort of out of the question. Okay, so the, um, the notion of um, are there effective treatments for PTSD, and this came from, this slide comes from the best practice guidelines of the ISTSS 2009. Um, and it hasn't really changed all that very much. It's um, <clears throat> the case that the psychosocial treatments really uh, 
um, are the first line treatments, exposure therapy, cognitive therapy, cognitive processing therapy, anxiety management, desensitization, and there is some signal to the use of eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. At the pharmacological level, the only thing really that um, has any kind of endorsement is the use of the SSRIs. I wish that we had more. There was a story being told about prazosin, which is an anti-hypertensive and alpha um, adrenergic um, activist that we thought was going to be helpful, and it doesn't seem to be the case, that it's as helpful as the group from Seattle thought it was. But we'll see. They're still doing additional data analyses, and um, you know, the hope is that there will be something that will help people with PTSD. Uh, there are some trials in the consortium to alleviate PTSD. Looking at Special K, which is a street drug, um, I don't know much about it, but it's a street drug. It's called ketam it's ketamine. It's called Special K. But there are some there are some really interesting studies on people with uh, major depression that's unremitting that it's helping these people recover. And there was one study, a, a fairly reasonable study done out of Mount Sinai in New York by Adrian Fedev, who um, found that for people with PTSD, it was also very, now the effects are short-lived, but we need to figure out what is it that's helping here that's really giving them gr a great sense of relief. And can we sort of identify, isolate the compound, make it non sort of abuse or reduce the abuse potential, and then capitalize on the medication? There's a lot of work to do, but as I think most of you likely know, the pharmaceutical companies are not interested in in anything that's cognitive, whether it's Alzheimer's disease or um, any of the psychiatric conditions. It's just not um, something that they're interested in. It's high risk, um, big expense, no gain uh, in, the, in uh, so many ways. So it's, it's a very difficult thing right now. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what I think of as the common PTSD treatment elements. And uh, th this comes from um, the fact that I was actively engaged in two versions of the PTSD best practice guidelines. Um, the, uh, one was FOA, Keen, and Friedman. The more recent one was FOA, Keen, Friedman, and Judy Cohen. And, um, you know, I kind of thought, you know, there's, after reading all of these reviews that were done, we commissioned reviews from very smart, talented people who did these reviews, and then we as editors would read them and then talk about them and try. But one of the things, one of the things that, um, that I kind of thought of after we were all done was, you know, there's so many common elements in these various treatments that are being described here. What might be the, con and so I wrote a paper or two about what I think the common elements are for PTSD treatment. And I think the first thing is, you know, basically, oh boy, well, what happened to this? Okay, anyway, the first thing is about disclosure. Okay, so number one is disclosure of what it is that actually happened. And I'll say this because it is the, the case that so many people who have been exposed to traumatic events, there's a considerable amount of shame, humiliation, guilt um, about what happened. And when that's indeed the case, they may be very unlikely to share that information with you. And in so many of our cases, especially early on, but um, yeah, especially early on, people would not tell us what actually happened to them on the battlefield. And it would be perhaps five, 10, 15 sessions into therapy when they'll come in and say, you know, doc, I have to tell you what really happened that day. And they will reveal atrocities, whether they were involved with the atrocities, or the atrocities were committed against um, the Americans, or they will reveal some of their failures under fire that just continued to stick with them. And that, I think, is critical for everybody to remember, that if somebody comes in and says, you know, I was, physically beaten up, or I was in a car wreck, or I was in a plane wreck, whatever, to keep in mind that there may be more happening, that there may be more behind the presenting trauma. Now, it used to be that I would say that there may be trauma behind the presenting complaints. 
you know, someone says, I'm having trouble sleeping or I'm, I'm having trouble with my anger. And then you would work and then you would find out that there were traumatic experiences in the background. Life and death is what I mean by traumatic. And now I'm thinking that it's not only the presenting problem behind which there may be a traumatic event, but there may be another traumatic event that's really driving the reactions to other experiences and presenting as insomnia, anger, rage, you know, the driving thing, all of which you need to be alert for. This doesn't mean to be skeptical of your patients necessarily, only to remain open and to stay open and to consider what else might be driving some of the problems that they're, high, uh, th that they're having. So these other things, direct therapeutic exposure, education about trauma and PTSD. You know, if I, I, I really kind of wish I had a dollar or two for every patient who said, you mean somebody else has this same experience? People can't put it all together. Sometimes they can't even index to the event. They kind of just have this very diffuse experience. It's especially true when the traumatic events occurred in adolescence or perhaps even earlier in childhood. And that's really, you know, sort of difficult for them to put things into words to describe for you what it is that's actually happened. There are key distor distortions that occur in people who have PTSD. It was my fault. I should never have been there. If only I'd stayed home and studied. I should never have gone out with him. I should have called the police. All ownership. On the battlefield, the same. If only I had done, then this wouldn't happen. Do you remember the uh, quote from Sebastian Younger's book, the book that I had up there? It was kind of like, um, it wasn't the fear or the horror or the terror. It was the loss of their friends. It was about their, their friends' deaths and what they didn't do that might have prevented their friends from dying. It was this thing called survivor guilt, if you are familiar with that term, that becomes very prominent in the minds of these people. And these are some of the key distortions. Now I have to say, just for those of you who are young in the audience here, you know, you do have to be careful about challenging cognitive distortions like right up front. You gotta be careful, you gotta go slowly, you gotta listen, you gotta hear, and you gotta sort of try to very gradually begin the process of helping them come up with alternative appraisals of the experience that they've had. That's the skill in therapy. It's a big skill. It does take time. Because if you try to say, well, you know, how could you have prevented your friends from dying? You'll be going smack up against a very strong defense. It was my job to prevent that from happening. And I didn't do my job. That becomes a matter of the conversation. So if you, once you attack the defense head on, you may have a lot longer to go in therapy if they'll stick with you. Okay, skills for anxiety management, and this all goes back some years here. So I'll just say that, um, you know, there's a lot of literature, and there's more than 200 randomized clinical trials in the PTSD field right now, more than 200. This is unimaginable for me. Uh, this was the first RCT, randomized clinical trial, um, in the PTSD field. And it came from our group and published in 1989. And this is what we were waiting for. Um, and I'll just say that uh, there was very good news in so many ways in this study. This is the pre, this is post-treatment, 12 to 14 sessions. And this is a six-month follow-up. And this was a waiting list comparison group. So what everybody was really afraid of when we finally set things to experimental task actually did not cause people to get worse. That was what the big fear was. Not only did it not cause people to get worse, people got better. And more than 50% got significantly better. 
Today, we'd say, we'll go back in and see how many people lost the diagnosis. And I never did that because in 1988, whenever I was preparing this manuscript, that was not sort of a concept, how many people lost. But I would say that more than 50% probably lost the PTSD diagnosis. They were doing really good. And I'll just give you a sense that one patient who had been very seriously disturbed, very impaired, did really well in this clinical trial. So much so that his wife came with him to therapy one day and sort of got me before we went in uh, to the therapy room and said to me, I don't know what you're doing, doc, but keep going. So um, I'm not sure I knew what I was doing at the time, but, um, but it seemed to have worked out pretty well. Um, there are other trials. This is um, from my friend Edna Foa in Pennsylvania. And here you have prolonged exposure combined with stress inoculation, which is an anxiety management, you know, relaxation, diaphragmatic breathing. And she combined them here, and then she e delivered each of them separately. And you see that um, over time, these were all the same. Um, this is very good news because it means that there are three effective treatments for PTSD that fit very different personal styles and maybe even patient needs. Uh, this is, um, oh, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, quotes here. You gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. And this is Eleanor Roosevelt um, who said this in the 1940s during the war. I read this in uh, Jacqueline um, Kearns Goodwin's book. on um, FDR in World War II. But in any case, this is really a, sort of a depiction of what does exposure therapy really mean. And she captured it. This was in the 40s. And she just sort of said it in a way that um, I could never say it. This is, what, this is what you're asking people to do, to face the things that were so disturbing to them. And then, you know, if you want to use the, uh, the terms of um, logotherapy, to master it, to give back to the world, et cetera, all of which I think are beautifully described. So, you know, in terms of trying to figure out um, what it is that you really need to do for people with PTSD, um, from my vantage point, it's a period of stabilization. Often folks come to you with a lot of the addictions problems, very active alcohol and or drugs. Um, and there needs to be a period of stabilization before you can really get to the hard work. Followed by trauma education, followed by the anxiety management, teaching them skills, and then followed by what we call the trauma focused work. For example, exposure, but there are other kinds. Followed by relapse prevention. And I'll just say at the outset that anniversary dates, if there's a specific discrete trauma, People know when that date comes, and that date has often meant very difficult times, often for days before and days after. Giving them some skills to use, <laughs> giving them you know, a session during that sort of period leading up to it can prevent a relapse to alcohol or drugs or a relapse to PTSD. And so just keeping in mind that these anniversary dates can be very, very important for uh, people with PTSD. The, it could be that they lost someone um, at the time of the trauma or whatever. And ju just to, to be very sensitive to the fact that relapses can occur, but there's a growing understanding of when these relapses do occur. And the relapses are, you know, temporal cues, or they could be just contextual cues of the traumatic e event itself. So I'll just, um, if I can, I'm just going to go quickly through um, the many different kinds of exposures, in vivo assisted exposure, narrative therapy. This is being used in um, mostly in developing countries right now, in Africa and Asia, whereby, you know, th the notion of um, psychotherapy is really quite foreign, and yet... Um, people are going to these sites where there's been massive tragedy. 
and helping people use the mechanisms that are culturally very well known to the people in these parts of the world. And so there were just a series of spectacular studies on narrative therapy um, published about um, the effectiveness of going into these communities, having people from the communities serving as sort of the leaders, uh, whether they're like, like health care workers or whatever, um, and the impact of what is essentially an exposure-based model of having people tell the story. And what's amazing to everyone across the world who reads this or hears this work is how well received this narrative therapy is and how much it's helping people every bit as much as the other kinds of more sophisticated, if you will, mental health services provided in the more developing world. Communication skills training. Um, I'll just briefly say that what this um, means for me is that you can often find patients who can't put the traumatic experience into words. And this is something that becomes really complicated because it makes it hard for them to access the details of the trauma. And so the ways in which we've gone to work with people who have had these difficulties has been to try to help them put into words what they can and then to add to, subtract from, and then to practice the delivery again. So multiple times helping people so that they can then begin the process of communicating what it is that has happened to them to people in their lives and in their environments in an effort to try to get them to be really their own therapist, if you will, and to identify people in their lives that they trust, whom they trust, who could be receptive to hearing about the terrible shit. And much of this is involved, involves domestic violence, childhood abuse, perhaps childhood sexual abuse, and especially when there's a known um, assailant, um, a father, an uncle, a brother, et cetera. And how do you put all of this into words so that others can hear it? It's a really powerful tool um, when the person can engage in it with you. And that's an important when or if. And then I'll just say writing of diaries, again, important, critical. Um, there's a lot of work that's now coming out about the power of writing about traumatic experiences. My colleagues um, in Boston, Denise Sloan and Brian Marks have taken the psycho social psychologist Jamie Pennybaker's work to a very clinical level and for clinical populations has brought this strategy into the clinics, working with patients to put into writing what it is that happened, what their emotional reactions are to what's happened, and what they think about their role in the experience, and then work with them in trying to come up with a more realistic appraisal of what it is that's happened to them. And this writing, this keeping of the diary, is a profoundly powerful tool. And I'll just say to you that the evidence that exists, and there's now a, a series of studies that's come out on this topic, suggests that this approach is every bit as successful as any of the individually based psychotherapies trying to access trauma. So there are many roads. So I'll, I'll just really kind of conclude here uh, this afternoon by saying there are many roads to Rome here. There are many ways of going about trying to help people process the emotions associated with a traumatic life event. My goal here today was to give you a flavor. I think I opened up, I hope I opened up, piqued some interest in this area of great importance in my mind to the field of mental health. Uh, I tried to give you some of the history in the background. I tried to give you some information about 
approaches to evaluate people with PTSD, and there are many tools out there. And then also some of the approaches for treating PTSD. And these are approaches that are, I think, the most sound in terms of evidence. If you want to read more, I would suggest the um, Best Practice Guidelines book from 2009, Foa, Keen, Friedman, and Cohen. Um, I am not hawking any books. All of the resources from this, and there have been quite a few resources, go to the society. It goes to uh, good causes in, um, in that organization. Um, mostly the publishers get money, trust me on that. <laughs> but, 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 but I don't get a dime. Um, but there, that's a good resource. There is a great website um, that the National Center has. It is for patients and for clinicians, and you can go on to the website. It's um, basically www.ncptsd, National Center for PTSD, ncptsd.va.gov. And there is a world of resources on that website. It is an award-winning website. Again, I, I certainly get no money, but I take no credit because I've done virtually nothing about uh, the website that's in the hands of a few technical people. So with, with that, I want to thank you all for coming and for listening so attentively. And um, I'm deeply appreciative of uh, my first visit to Albizu University. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>